Hi there. My name is Chuck Rosansky and I own Mile High Comics and I also own the Pueblo Treasures Gallery. And I'm working to turn this into a museum. And as you can see, I'm the chief cook and literally bottle washer. And my only assistant, Nikki, come here. My only assistant, Nikki, here was the one who was chewing the bone in my last video and being very noisy. But she's such a sweetie and she's the only one who keeps me company when I'm doing all of this work by myself that it's great to have somebody who hangs out with me and who doesn't mind the smell of Windex. Anywho, um, the aisle that we're in right now is a formative aisle. So in other words, I've on this side managed to get a whole bunch of my Santo Domingo um, Kewa pottery out. Um, actually managed to even separate a little bit of it by style. But it's not the way that I want it to be. I'd like to have every piece labeled to the extent that I know the makers. And um, these particular cases, we had to rob the doors from them after we had a break-in here at the store. And the guy used a tire iron to smash out some of our glass doors downstairs. So I let them cannibalize some of my doors from up here. But that's basically a process that I'm continuing where I'm doing all the work myself um, except for the actual laying of the floor which my friend John is doing. Um, even putting in lights and things like that I'm doing more of that myself. Um, I'm putting in all the glass, I'm having glass cut, I'm ordering um, brackets so that we have enough brackets and then of course I also buy the potteries and this gallery as it is to this point um, is four years worth of my individual effort. I've really not had anyone else helping me, um, which is probably just as well because um, pottery is delicate and I don't want to put anybody else in the responsibility of having to deal with it um, and possibly break a piece. I've had um, staff members break pieces in the past and it turned out to be a very traumatic experience for them much more so than for me um, and so I have just learned the hard way do it myself okay so when I'm doing this myself I have lots and lots and lots of time to ruminate to think to chew my cud to try and come up with you know, who would what and where and why and how and what, you know, why would somebody do this? Um, I, as I explained in my last video, I have 10,000 pieces and uh, not all of them are out yet. As you can see, uh, these are all filled with this Letta pottery. And if you look at sort of the chaos that's back in this area, um, this is primarily Mexican folk art, although um, there's some uh, Casas pottery here which comes very close to being um, uh, American since it's right over across the border, certainly North American. Um, and then I still have Mojave over here, I still have Anasazi um, up above. Um, these are from some of the uh, Pueblos that are Rio Grande Pueblos, but they're um, not the larger ones, not the ones that produce a lot of pottery. Um, and so that would be places like Powake. Um, also some of the Towa Pueblos. Um, my micaceous pottery is still almost all in storage and needs to come out. But I got Santa Domingo out and that, as you can see, I mean it's five full cases and then there's more that's up here on top. Um, there's a lot of it. And I really want to try and make sure that I give all of the uh, Kewa potters credit for what they've been doing and then the same with um, all of the other Pueblos that I work with. This is fairly important to me and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. But backtracking a little bit, one of the things that people really, um, they ask me about when they come here and they're kind of gauche questions. So I go out of my way to, to be nice. But it really, if, if you're going to visit the Pueblo, please don't ask me these two questions. And the first one is, do you have any Maria pottery? And the reason why people ask that is because that's the one name that pops into their mind. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit about 
why that, that bothers me. Um, Maria Martinez from San Ildefonso Pueblo um, definitely is the best known of all the Pueblo potters. Uh, Margaret Tafoya from Santa Clara um, had similar renown, at least amongst people that were serious about potteries. And then, um, of course, Nampeo Apano uh, was the, the really first superstar in the business. But starting in the 1920s, uh, Maria's husband, Julian Martinez, um, he was marketing whiz. And he basically turned Maria into a brand and uh, went out there and got her to go to things like the Pan American Exposition and the World's Fair and um, to produce potteries. And um, she really got out, kind of out of her comfort zone. But at the same time, uh, Julian got it out there and got her selling potteries really well. Now we'll go around the corner here um, over into the area where I have my San Ildefonso pottery and I want to show you something here. Um, this is a Maria bowl that I bought not that long ago. It has the most astounding polish. When you hold it, it feels like glass. It is truly amazing. I got a little dust on it, I guess, but um, the finish on it is just absolutely beautiful. But, and this is a big but, um, you know, it's etched in the clay down here, Marie po Maria Poveca, okay? And this would have been later in her career, in about the 1960s. Unbelievably beautiful and proficient bowl. She potted it, but I don't think she polished it. Her sister, Clara, lived with her, and her sister, Clara, polished all day long. <laughs> so, this was a group effort for which Julian, um, before he passed away in 19, I think it was 43 when he passed away, um, uh, Julian really did a brilliant job of branding Maria Pottery. Um, but Maria Pottery was more successful than she could produce. So a lot of it was being made by her neighbors, people like Rose Gonzalez and Juanita Wopin at San I. Um, and some of it, as the Blairs, um, pointed out in their book about Margaret Tafoya, which is one of my favorite books. I mean, I, I look at this book at least a couple times a year, and there are passages in there that I just read over and over and over again, and it's just an awesome reference book. Um, but one of the things that was true, and it says, uh, during the 1930s and until the time of his tragic death in 1943, Julian Martinez and his son John are remembered as having purchased unfired pottery at Santa Clara. This fact has been verified by some of that Pueblo's people who either recall selling directly to the Martinez's or being present when their res, uh, relatives were involved in these transactions. Margaret Tafoya herself states that's true. I am one of her, Maria's, pottery makers, also my mother, my sister Christina, and also Mrs. Candelario Suazo. Uh, commonly referred to as greenware, um, which is a different expression than greenware today. Greenware today is considered like plaster of Paris type pottery, but in those days, if you sold a bowl that had been um, formed, but not yet finished, polished, slipped, um, that was considered greenware in those days. So, um, did you sell mostly large pieces to Julian and John? No, all kinds. They would order from us wedding vases, small pieces, Thunderbirds bowls, little baskets, bowls with handles in, in the center. And sometimes they order bigger wedding jars, large pieces, medium size, and water jars. So, this was not a one-off kind of a thing. This was an actual assembly line, factory production kind of an effort on the part of Julian to keep Maria's pottery available and out there. And uh, on many levels, this was a huge blessing that he was doing. Uh, Margaret Tafoya, further on, and I'll paraphrase here, um, says that she was surprised that they were able to get such a premium for Maria's name, and she felt a little bit put off by that. But at the same time, the money that they got was really, really handy. And so that, that was a good thing. So anyway, 
I really like Maria Martinez pottery. Um, I, I love the boxes, but when I look at a box like this, I say, okay, did Maria actually make that? Or is that one of Margaret Tafoya's boxes that just happens to have Marie signed into the bottom of it? I, n I don't know, and on, on many levels, I don't care. What matters is that it's beautiful Pueblo pottery. It's from the time period, 1920s, 1930s, that I'm particularly fond of. But when I see neophytes to the business, and all they want to know is, do I have Maria's? Maria's are probably the single most common Pueblo pottery. And that's starting to be reflected in prices for those of you who are, who are monetarily focused. Um, Maria pottery today is selling, especially after you adjust for inflation, um, for about half of what it was selling when I started in the business in, in um, you know, 1998, 1999, 2000. Um, a lot of people have Maria's. A lot of those people are passing on and their um, heirs are getting their pottery. And I have a group of Maria pottery that's being offered to me right now. I don't really know if I actually want it because I'm looking for things that are more interesting and unusual. So like when I'm looking for um, individual Cochiti pieces, like the ones that were done in the 1880s and the 1890s, I find them much more unique and compelling. Like I found a mate to this little badger picture last night on eBay and I, and I purchased it. And that's the kind of thing that really, really gets me excited because it has not only imagination that went into it, but also it's a unique piece. The piece that I have that's very similar to it is not the same, not even close. Um, whereas if you look for those beautiful black polished bowls by Maria that, that have that insane stone polishing, um, yeah, they're out there. You know, you can, just about anybody can get them. And this is sort of the interesting part. I believe I bought this from Mark Sablet at a uh, White Hawk Indian show about 10 or 12 years ago. It's the only one. And I haven't seen anything like that until last night. And the one that I got last night has a broken handle. I don't care. I, I, I'm not a mint collector. I don't intend to resell. My goal is to have the most unique and interesting pieces so that when someone comes here and they want to take a look at things that were produced in the 1880s, 1890s, or in the case of the funny little cookie monster there with the stripes on it, um, that's one of the very first pieces ever produced by Virgil Ortiz. When he was just a little kid and he was going down to the Indian market uh, with his mom, uh, Safarina. And nowadays, Virgil's pieces, a lot of them, um, which involve a lot of bondage and, and, and very avant-garde themes, a lot of his stuff sells for $10,000, $20,000, and people are really, really interested in that. I'm more interested in where did he come from, and then what was his mom's stuff, and then this, this uh, Little Mermaid, which I did end up paying a fair amount of money for, that Little Mermaid right there is a later Virgil piece, and that's what this museum is about. It's about showing the evolution of style of not only an entire Pueblo, but then individual creators themselves. And that's why I have some Marias, and I certainly like Marias. But let me give you another ex example. San Ildefonso Pueblo. And, uh, oh, goodness. i got to try and remember now, because I'm suddenly having a brain fart. Um... This is by Marianita Roybal. Now, Marianita is kind of known um, for the fact that she was the first Pueblo potter to ever sign her name to a piece of pottery, back before New Mexico was even a state. And God, don't ask me to reference this, because I've seen it, I, I know it's there. Um, but she made a piece of pottery, which I don't know where it is. It could be in, in the Museum of uh, Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. But anyway, it's a piece of her pottery from, um, I believe it was about 18... Maybe it was for the bicent or for the centennial, 1876. But she was one of the very first to ever sign her name, and I'm not sure how she even became literate at that moment in time because um, 
uh, a lot of Pueblo potters did not uh, develop reading and writing skills until the 1920s. Um, so maybe she, it was one of the forced boarding schools that she was at. But anyway, I would not trade this broken piece of pottery. See, the upper bill is gone and the handle that used to be here, gone. But I still wouldn't trade a Maria Nita Roy Ball for a Maria Martinez because you can get Maria's all day long. You don't have to be diligent or smart. You just got to have a platinum card. And you can walk right now. You can go to Santa Fe at this very moment and you can buy, um, oh, 20 or 30 Maria's in a day because there's galleries down there that are awash in Maria's. Now, Maria polychromes, as opposed to black, those are harder to find. So if you could find a Maria, I have one Maria and Julian uh, polychrome, I believe, which is this one right here. I believe that's a later Julian that he did in the 1930s, but it's not signed, so I don't know for sure. Um, they, they weren't really that interested um, in something that Julian, per se, did. Um, this one over here may also uh, be a Julian. It's of a similar style. Um, but I don't really care one way or another. What I really care about, though, these Marianita Roy balls, um, they're, they're really hard to find. And uh, she was a dot crazy person. She did lots and lots and lots of dots. Um, so when you're looking at Marianita Roy Ball, uh, let me see, where's that really beautiful one? Um, well, here's one right here. See, she's, again, all the dot craziness here. And then this christening vase that she did right here, which is actually a Pahogie Brownware. Um, that's got all kinds of dots. Here's another one she did, all kinds of dots. Here's another one she did, all kinds of dots. Are you starting to get the pattern? Um, even when they're not signed, sometimes you can kind of pick out who did what based on um, just certain proclivities that they had. I do not know. There may have been an actual reason why she was doing this. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so that question about do you have Maria's, that's one thing that kind of mm, sets me off a little bit. The other one is, what's your most valuable piece of pottery? God, I hate that question because that's like going up to someone who has 10,000 children and saying, you know, what's your favorite child? Um, really, this is, this is not about money. This is about studying cultures, studying people, studying the evolution of art. Um, I buy things. I mean, I have several pieces here that I paid more than $10,000 a piece for. And I have um, pieces that I didn't pay that much for that are actually more valuable than that. Um, but I don't do appraisals. The only reason I keep track of market values is because I'm poor. And I have to try and squeeze every possible bit of purchasing power out of the limited amount of cash flow that I have so that I can try and get things as inexpensively as possible. This put, puts me, by the way, at direct loggerheads with most dealers, same way that, that comic fans are at loggerheads with me when they come in here trying to buy comics as cheaply as possible. Well, it's a game. I mean, I, I want to try and extract as much revenue as I can from a given object. And comic books are mass-produced objects, okay? These are not. As I said in my first video, these are much more spiritually created. And that makes it a way different engagement when you're involved with Pueblo pottery. There has to be a tremendous amount of respect for the creators. Consider for a moment, San Ildefonso, right about the year 1900, which was when a lot, when uh, 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 Marianita Roy Ball and Maria Martinez was born right about then, and uh, a lot of the, the really noteworthy creators who started at San Ildefonso, there were only a hundred people living at the Pueblo at that time. Everyone else had either moved away or had died from one of the many, many diseases. Um, the uh, uh, 
Spanish flu of 1918-1919 was particularly devastating to the Pueblos and a lot of people died at Santa Clara, a lot of people died at San Ildefonso. And so when you're looking at this body of work right here, realize that there were maybe, and I'm pushing here, maybe 20 people at San I that were producing pottery during that period of time. And a lot of them that were, were, were finding that they could make just as much money turning their stuff over to Julian and having Marie put her name on them, um, then they could make trying to sell them themselves. So, you know, these a lot of these pieces are, are incredibly rare and incredibly hard to get, and I just wouldn't put a price on them. I mean, there, there's, there's no way. Um, let's go one more step. I got another little show and tell thing here. Um, this is I, and I try to stay positive a lot, okay? But this is a book that, when I figured out what was going on, really made me unhappy. Um, this is from the School of American Research, and uh, Kenneth Chapman did two of these. Now, Kenneth Chapman did this with the best of intentions um, and absolutely the worst of implementation. His intention was to try and um, validate and bring uh, public attention to Pueblo designs. And so he went through and he did a very beautiful study of, like this particular book is about um, the Kewa Pueblo of Santo Domingo. And it shows all of the different frets and designs that were being used. And it's, it's great. I mean, it has, as an academic study, it's really, really great. But it is also reflective of racism, of the absolute worst order because at this moment in time when this book was originally uh, put together it was still official American government policy to obliterate the Pueblo cultures. Um, Pueblo children were forcibly taken away, made to go oftentimes to to boarding schools if not the Indian school in Santa Fe but they were made to cut their hair they were made to speak English. They were not allowed to speak their, their Pueblo languages. And uh, it was the, the forced assimilation was the absolute policy of the land at the time. So when Chapman did this book, um, he refused to name any of the creators. So he, he has some really beautiful pots in here. Um, and the San Ildefonso book that he did is, is even better, um, but he absolutely and categorically refused to name any of the people from whom he, he got these pots. Now, we know that a couple of sisters, uh, the Aguilar sisters, um, were doing these um, reverse image pots. We know that today, okay? But I had to learn that elsewhere. Um, he doesn't give a single one of them credit for what they did. So they were kind of non-people to him. They were just subjects. And uh, unfortunately, that's led to a lot of um, weirdness when you go to the Pueblos. And this is something that you should kind of think about just right from the get-go. The Pueblos have been invaded um, ever since the 12 or 1300s when the Athabascans started coming down from the north and they suddenly found themselves with uh, uh, Diné and Apache neighbors all over the place, Utes. Um, and these were people who had not traditionally lived in that part of the world. They came down from central Canada. You know, right after that, in the uh, early 1500s, you had the Spanish conquistadors start coming in. And they came in with horses and guns and, and uh, dogs and uh, metal weapons. And they conquered the Pueblos and basically enslaved them. Then uh, the Pueblos threw them out in the revolt of 1680. And, the, and they came back again in 1692 under de Vargas, conquered the Pueblos all over again. But there's where the history gets weird, because the only reason why de Vargas was able to conquer the Pueblos all over again was because some Pueblos became his allies in exchange for better deals on land grants. Oy vey, it gets very complicated very fast. Then you get to 1840 and suddenly the Americans show up and uh, they throw out what had been, what had evolved into the Mexican government and uh, suddenly Christian missionaries are everywhere. 
And throughout all of this, the Pueblo people are finding their religion and their culture and their languages under assault. And uh, it's so bad. I mean, it was so bad. In the 1640s, I, I, I'm close there, um, the Inquisition actually came from Spain to the Pueblos and they, they sent inquisitors, people who would torture those who were considered to be um, heretics. And so when I attend Santa Clara Feast Day, which I did every year until they had to close the Pueblo because of COVID, um, while other people were enjoying the dances, I, I can't get out of my head the visions of the fact that they burned people alive in the plaza where the current Santa Clara peoples are dancing. They are dancing literally upon the ashes of their ancestors who were murdered because they refused to give up their religion. So, where I'm getting to on this is that when guys like Chapman start denying the existence of individual Pueblo people, that, oh, that really gets to me. Um, but also, this is sort of a mm, kind of a ground rule. If you're going to collect Pueblo pottery, always remember that there's going to be a certain degree of distancing. And this distancing is, no, is not intended to be offensive or anything, but the Pueblo people have survived years of essentially occupation and cohabitation. Um, they, they've managed to keep their culture alive throughout all of that by being fairly protective of it. And so even though I've been at almost every feast day, I've visited a lot of people at their houses, um, I've made a lot of good friends there, but I don't pry. And I don't have the hubris to believe that I have a right to know anything. If people volunteer and they give me some information, way cool. I like that. Okay, and I, I also read a lot on my own. Um, there are some excellent books, and maybe in the next um, little uh, chapter that we do, I'll show you some, some really good books that you can read if you want to know more. But there's two other things that I would kind of say. The first one is there always was some bias that somehow the Pueblo people were primitives. And I think that bias holds for what we would call Eurocentric cultures against uh, indigenous people of almost all kinds. And yet, um, knowledge of things like astronomy and quantum physics are much greater in the Pueblos than people have any concept. And the fact that there exist realities beyond that which we view as being the only one, um, that's, that's an important thing to, to remember. Um, you know, start thinking about um, the uh, folks in Australia and Dreamtime going walkabout and places like Ayers Rock that are um, places maybe that where, where worlds collide. These are things that the Pueblo people are very attuned to. They share some of that. There's a whole hell of a lot that they don't share. Um, and so, uh, part of the reason why they don't share it is because they've had so many people study them. Um, some of the people that have come in that um, wanted, first of all, to get their material objects, um, going all the way back to Matilda Cox Stevenson and, and uh, her avariciousness. And then, um, then there were legions of archaeologists who wanted to dig everything up and, and take everything to museums. And um, then there were social anthropologists who wanted to pry, 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 pry about every kind of uh, religious ritual. And again, all of this came from that basic premise that the Pueblos were going to be assimilated and disappear. Well, surprise, surprise, they have not assimilated. They have not disappeared. They have, uh, in point of fact, I think brilliantly adapted and they've adopted some elements of the cultural paradigm that's dominant at this particular moment but they've also kept a lot of their own stuff so um, if you're going to collect Pueblo pottery just be respectful and just realize that there's a lot of history that you really need to learn about 
in order to give your potteries context and in order to get a much better sense of how and why this is still being produced. Really, almost all of, I mean, some potters that I know don't even make as much money as they could be making working over at the casino. And yet they still do this because it is a labor of love. I referenced in the last um, little, little video that a lot of folks consider these potteries to be their, their children, their offspring, to be sentient. And uh, that's super important. This is, this is way more than just a bunch of people deciding that they're going to make potteries like their grandma did. Um, I'm going to close today with one of my favorite people from San Ildefonso. This is sort of like the opposite of Maria Martinez. On this far end, um, I have spent a lot of monies with uh, my friend Gilbert Sanchez. And this was one of the very first pieces that I ever bought from Gilbert. And I love it because it's kind of a Janus figure. It's not two-sided, but it has two images. Because if you look at it like this, it's this spiffy little rocket ship. But if you look at it like this, doo -doo 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 -doo, it's Jaws. And this is the kind of stuff that Gilbert loves to make, which, and this is super important, it's absolutely traditional pottery. But it's traditionally fired but I don't think that there was an L.A. Dodgers batting hat, okay, <laughs> with a neat little turquoise top. I don't think that the L.A. Dodgers envisioned this when they were planning their stuffs. And uh, let's take it a little bit differently, okay? A uh, little nine meter mi millimeter. I believe this was supposed to be a Glock. Look at the beautiful micaceous on it, but yeah, it's a nine millimeter Glock made of Pueblo clay. We're talking about some really innovative adaptation here. Um, Gilbert knows, um, because I have Avon use all over my body, um, that I love Avon use, so he made me a couple. Um, he made me this incredible mace, a seahorse this way. Look at this, it is so cool totally Chinese type dragon and yet on this side it's much more of an Amanyu and then this becomes the crest. Brilliant! I swear there's something in the water down there. I don't know what it is but the brilliance of Gilbert and it's not just Gilbert by the way um, you know his his brother is equally good and, and his brother Vanessa is fantastic as well. They produce these pieces. Kathy Sanchez's mom does these insanely beautiful um, sienna and black and micaceous turtles with the lids that come off. Oh my God, and Kathy Sanchez is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Um, she and her daughter Corrine are, are uh, indigenous activists. Um, and Kathy actually ran uh, for Lieutenant Governor of New Mexico at one point on the Green Party ticket. So you're talking about an entire family that does really, really cool stuff. Look at this amazing little dragon. If you take a look, it's got, he, he etched it all the way around. I love the little band-aid on its butt. Okay, this is Gilbert. This is, this is just fun. Little Avanyu going up through this way. It's just, you know, that's the thing, is that when you realize that this can be an expression of someone's inner charm and inner happiness, um, it makes it so much more personal to me. <clears throat> so when, when people come to me, oh, by the way, I'm going to answer the goddamn question. Okay, that right there is an ogie pogey polychrome. In about 1700, when um, de Vargas finally conquered uh, Black Mesa and the uh, Santa Clara and San Ildefonso people that had held out there for well over a year, um, a lot of the people from San I became refugees. They refused to live under the Spanish, so a, a, a great number of them moved west and became a part of the Hopi 
nation. Um, they became what are called Hopi Tewa, and uh, they lived down at the bottom of the uh, of the mesas. Some of them, however, went up to the Four Corners region and actually went to live with the Navajo um, up by Farmington, New Mexico. And uh, 20 years ago, when things were first getting started, um, I found this particular piece in an online auction. And uh, I thought that it looked mighty familiar because I had just finished reading about eight books. Remember when I said you had to read a lot and it would really help you? Okay, I had just finished reading about eight books about Earl Morris, who um, in his later years lived in Boulder, where I live, and was the head of the University of Colorado Museum. Um, but starting in the 1890s, he was first a pot hunter with his dad, and then after his dad was killed in a bar fight, um, he and his mom traveled around the country and he gradually um, became an archaeologist working with some of the um, leading institutions. He worked with the uh, uh, New York Museum of Natural History. He worked with uh, the Smithsonian. He worked with all sorts of different people. But anyway, Earl um, found in the Farmington area, which is where he was from, um, a whole bunch of what were called ogie pogi polychromes. And uh, they were all busted, and his mom was an, actually an expert restorer, and so she restored them, and I think they have either four or five of them up at the University of Colorado Museum that are, that are restored. This, however, right there, that piece, is the only unbroken ogie pogi polychrome that I know to exist. I have another one um, over here that has this, this amazing checkerboard patterns in it, um, but that one had to be restored after a shipping company broke it all to hell. Um, but this is the last one with this checkerboard um, sort of dancing, dancing, uh, well, anyway, the, it, it's very, very rare and uh, it'd be incredibly hard to put a price on it because it's the only one in existence. It was found on a private ranch in a dry cave around uh, 1900 and the uh, grandchildren of the people that owned, me, owned the ranch sold me that one and then they sold me this um, jar which is right here um, and it's circa 1700 also. Um, Earl Morris's successor at the University of Colorado Museum, Linda Cordell, is the one that uh, uh, verified that that was a San Ildefonso pot, by the way. And uh, this is sort of a step up from a Jedido uh, uh, piece, which is a brown on yellow. Um, that, that actually is slipped cream. So technically, I guess it's a polychrome. Um, but anyway, this is starting to get a little bit too technical. But suffice it to say that these two uh, pieces that came from that, that dry cave, um, they, were, they were made um, by people who were hiding out from the Spanish. And uh, so those are the kinds of things, those are the kinds of bits of history that when you can learn it, it just makes everything so much different. I mean, look at these early micaceous pieces. These. These are not the kind of thing that people think about when they think of San Ildefonso or Santa Clara, um, but they spent a lot of time going up to Taos. They sold potteries up there, um, and they also would just visit with the people up at the Taos and Picuries Pueblos, and they would trade for clay, and um, clay with a lot of mica in it, micaceous clay, is known as especially good for uh, utilitarian cooking purposes. And so they would use these for um, cooking stews and for cooking, they, a lot of these would, would be called bean pots. Um, but these are really early, like 1850. Um, this one may even be a little bit earlier than that. It might be 1800. Um, anyway, that's it for today. You learned a little bit about a Maria. You learned about why I don't like being asked by, you know, what's your most valuable pot. Um, you learned a little bit about how not to poke your nose into business where you don't belong. Okay. But you did, I hope, also learn a little bit about how much joy and fun you can have 
gaining knowledge. And that's what my collection is going to be left here for, is so that future people, long after I'm dead, will have a reference that they can go back to and look at pieces and they can say, oh my god, I remember when I first saw this in a video <laughs> and now he's dead <laughs> and I get to look at it even more. Well, that's cool. I don't, you know, we're all just here on this earth to do good and we're but guardians. And for me, guarding this pottery, working here at night, having my little dog, look at her over there. <laughs> you're, you're sleeping on the job, girl. Just working with my little dog and having a good time working on, on this project. Leaving a legacy behind. I mean, it's kept me broke. I never have any monies. Um, but I feel like I'm leaving something behind that's important. And I hope that this is, this is helpful to you. Do something good today. Do something that will make the world a better place. It's the greatest reward you can give yourself. That's it for today. Thanks, and we'll see you in Chapter 3 soon. Okay, pickle butters. <laughs>